Uh, everybody, very happy uh, to see you guys here. And uh, it is a great honor for me to share some thoughts about the uh, piano sonatas of Beethoven that I'm going to perform uh, in the uh, coming Friday, okay? So I would like to start my talk with uh, the following. Uh, can, can you people show the PPT for me? Uh, uh, about the uh, two sides of Beethoven's uh, inner world, okay? Uh, first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about those four sonatas that I am going to perform on this Friday. Uh, all of them are coming from his mid-period uh, works, okay? And most of them are very famous. Okay? Uh, so, as we all know, you know, the compositions of Beethoven normally divided into three uh, periods, okay? The early works, and then the late, and obviously the middle ones. Okay, uh, it is the middle one which uh, has the most influences on the composers of the next generation. Normally speaking, almost all the composers come after Beethoven are influenced by him. Okay, so he's a very uh, influential figure during that period of time. Uh, by saying so, most of the time, the works that influences the next generation is from his middle period works, not the late works, nor the early works, obviously. Because at the time when he's composed and finished his last works, which are those five Beethoven uh, late piano sonatas, the few string quartets, uh, and so on, uh, the Misa Solenimus, all those works, at that time when they first come out, people don't understand. And they think Beethoven is crazy, okay? How come he's going to write such things? Uh, on several reasons. On one reason is because uh, those things are not suitable to perform on any of the instruments specified by Beethoven. If he says this is for piano sonata, those pianists are unwilling to play it because it doesn't fit the piano and it doesn't fit the hand, okay? Okay, if you are talking about string quartets and they think about, you know, what the hell is going on in these string quartets? It's not following the form, okay? And, you know, some of the uh, registrations of the, of the instruments are not properly or normally used, okay? Uh, so people have a resentment against his old work. At least 50 years later, for the next two or three generations, after they started to understand what he's trying to say, and with the development, development of the instruments, including the piano, and also uh, the technique of playing those instruments, okay? Then people started to gradually accept those later works. Therefore, the most most of Beethoven's most famous work and all those influential works comes from his middle period, okay? And when we think about Beethoven, we always think he's always angry, mad at somebody <laughs> or something, okay? Always nervous or something like this. But actually, this is not true. This is only uh, a part of the facts or maybe, you know, very biased. Okay, today I'm going to talk about uh, these elements, okay? So, uh, this is Beethoven, and uh, uh, he sits down, and this is the statue they put on in the uh, Vienna. So if you have ever been to Vienna, you will see this one. Uh, he has another great one uh, in Bohm, uh, where he was born. Uh, that one is standing, okay? <laughs> this one is sitting. <coughs> All right, so this is. Uh, as we are very clear and we are very certain to know before Beethoven, uh, we have Haydn and Mozart, okay? Uh, Haydn is actually his teacher. At first, Beethoven would like to study with Mozart. However, you know, uh, his mother passed away, okay, when he first come to Vienna the first time. So Beethoven must went back to Bohm to take care of the family business. So when he come back to Vienna the second time, Mozart was gone, okay? So uh, he can only study with Haydn. 
Uh, however, he has quite a tough relationship with Haydn because Haydn's uh, personality is completely different from Beethoven's, okay? Uh, so as what we can see, uh, obviously Haydn and Mozart are great composers of the classical period. Okay? What comes after Beethoven, uh, before his death, all the famous romantic composers of the next generation has already made their name already, okay? Including Schubert, okay? Including Weber, the, the Freischutz, the opera that we talked about some, some years ago. And uh, obviously the most famous one is Rossini. So during the last 10 years of Beethoven's life, everything, uh, everyone thinks that Beethoven is crazy, okay? Now, the greatest composer during that period of time is no longer Beethoven. It is Rossini and Weber, okay? Uh, Schubert, nobody cares. So, uh, you can see it is during this period of time that we can see Beethoven is actually living in a period of transition from classical to romantic. Therefore, in his middle period composition, we can clearly see two things. One is his maturity of compositional technique, very certain. The second thing is it is very certain that some of his personalities are clearly reflected in his middle period works. Okay, so we go to the next one. Uh, therefore, Beethoven is at a you know, crossway or you know, intersection of classical period and the romantic period, okay? So when we first talk about classical, uh, actually the classical period of uh, this period of music, most of the time they refer to the model of Greek, okay? Not in the past, but ancient Greek. Uh, we talk about, you know, uh, 300 years before BC, during their golden years. So we are talking about form, structure, violence, control, okay, and re restrain. Everything must be polished and good, okay. That is classical. That is why Mozart and Haydn model their works on this. So everything must be in form. Either it is in a sonata form or a symphony or a string quartet, okay. And all these pieces have multi-movements. That means if you have one sonata, then there might be two or three or four movements in there. And each movement must be written in a particular form. And it has to follow order, okay? Most of the time, they do not express too much of the personal feeling of the composer during the time of his composition. So this is clear. So when we talk, talk about classical, we always refer to this form, structure, balance, control. Everything is well bi balanced. Uh, one very powerful work to describe this ki kind of characteristic is objective. Okay, it has to be objective. Okay, everything in control. So when we talk about classical, then actually we are talk talking about Apollo. <laughs> okay. Uh, so everything is objective, uh, we, everything is in control, uh, balanced uh, mentally, spiritually, mm, behave, uh, and we talk about always his son, okay, uh, all those bright things, uh, very calm, the whole thing is, okay. So one important art form related to Apollo is poem, poetry, okay. Uh, that is what we call Apollo. So everything is in order, in control. That's very important, okay? Very objective, seldom emotional. Uh, so this is Apollo. Uh, this is the painting of Apollo. So you can see everything is bright, everything is uh, in form. Uh, those artists over here, they, they certainly can immediately notice the figure and the painting and everything on the canvas is all according to the rules, okay? 
Now, on the other extreme, there's another Greek god uh, is romantic, okay? Another emotion is romantic. Romantic, we always talk about emotion, personal expression, passion, okay? Sometimes suffering, struggle, subjective things, okay? Oh. So uh, when we talk about romantic things, we are talking about human nature. It's not God's nature, human nature. And we talk about subjective things, not objective things, okay? Uh, when we talk about romantic, we always associate Dionysus, the, 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 the wine girl of, uh, of Greek, okay? Associate with the, uh, with the uh, romanticism, okay? Uh, he's always enjoying wine, or woman, party, okay, all, all kinds of those things. So uh, it is always about human enjoyment, about emotion, about excitement. Very human, actually very human, not God. Uh, so one important uh, art form associated with Dionysus is tragedy, okay? So uh, for us, associate the poetry to Apollo, the drama or the tragedy to Dionysus, okay? When we talk about poetry, it's like what we talk about the poetry of our own Chinese Tang Dynasty, Tong Qiu, Gede Tong Xi. Uh, no matter how emotional or how much they want to express their meaning or their feeling, it is always in control, always following the form. No matter the, 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 the poetry is how emotional, it is always four phrase or eight phrase, uh, five words or seven words a phrase. You, ha you have to follow the order. When we talk about the Romanticism, then we are talking about Song Dynasty, okay? Or maybe later, uh, talk about uh, Song Qi, okay? Or those, 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 those uh, new poetry no longer follows, you know, each phrase, each, each phrase must have five words or seven words or only four phrases. No, you have long phrases and short phrases at the same time. So uh, in the West, it is like this as well. So when we talk about drama, we talk about sad story, then we talk about Dionysus. We talk about feeling, human feeling, human suffering, okay? So when we talk about form, structure, then we talk about Apollo. So this is his, his painting, okay? Always grape, wine, drinking. Uh, there's his follower, uh, the fowl, okay? So when we talk about and compare these two kinds of uh, uh, mentality, then we talk about Apollo, uh, Apollonian characteristic and Dionysian characteristic. That means one is classicism, one is romanticism. Actually, in the whole history of Western music, it is the alternation of these two systems. Okay? We obviously, when we talk about romantic, it's Dionysus. Okay? So when we talk about classical, it is Apollo. Before classical, we have Baroque, it's romantic. Before, romantic, before Baroque, it is Renaissance, then it is classical. Okay? Otherwise, we won't call that period of art or style as Renaissance because it's the rebirth of the art of Greek. Okay? So these are the com comparisons of those two styles in art, and especially in music. So one must pay more attention to the structure, the organization, the orderly. Uh, we talk about the light, the dawn, okay? Sometimes a little bit humor, happy, or uh, something like this, okay? About angel, everything, right? The other side is away from the establishment. Okay, now it is talking about chaos, it's talking about passion, it's talking about darkness, sometimes crying, yelling, shouting, uh, fighting or something, killing or whatever. Okay, at the end, everything, uh, everybody gets mad, okay? Like all the romantic operas, at the end, everybody dies. Okay, anyway, so uh, talking about the dark side or the human nature more, obviously, 
this will not be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sometimes both characters mixed, okay? Sometimes it's not so well cut in the middle. So in those four sonatas, are, you know, more closely represent Beethoven's Apollonian style or character is these two sonatas. One is the Fantasy Sonata, Op. 27, number one in E flat major. Uh, that is actually the sister work of Moonlight, okay? Beethoven wrote two sonatas and published them at the same time. Both bears the opus number of 27. One is uh, the Fantasy Sonata, the other one is Moonlight Sonata, okay? Uh, the other one sonata, those four sonatas that, that I'm going to perform on Friday is Wolf's Time. Uh, talking about the dawn, okay? The dedicatee that Beethoven dedicated this sonata to is uh, a noble living in uh, Vienna. Actually, he is uh, a bohemian, okay? Uh, that's his name. But actually, we are talking about the dawn, the, the sun rises, okay? So this is the Apollonian uh, uh, representative of Beethoven's middle period. So in this sonata, uh, although it is classical, however, formal structure, informal structure and informal design, they have very many uh, breakthroughs, okay? Some old form in the sonata form or the design of the whole sonata has been slowly and gradually uh, dismantled by Beethoven. He has breaking some new grounds as well. Uh, however, the whole sonata, as you know, if you know them, you will notice that it is organized, well planned, and also well balanced. Okay? Uh, uh, there's some contrast, obviously, fast, slow, uh, long, short, okay, uh, these kind of things, but always constrained, no, not running out of control, not like this, okay? So when you listen to these two sonata, it is always uplifting of spirit. And uh, if you listen or you perform, at the end you feel very uh, fulfilled, okay? And happy, actually, fulfillment, okay? And for the, uh, uh, this is the fantasy sonata uh, that Beethoven wrote, okay? Opus 27, number one. As you can see, this sonata has four major parts, one, two, three, four, okay? However, none of these parts are written in sonata form. That means although this is called a sonata, but actually it has not a single movement written in sonata form, okay? Uh, this is one thing. The second thing is this sonata, they play through all these parts, four major parts, okay? Without a break, there's no break between the parts. You have to play through them. Oh, this, this is very important. The next one very important is there's some uh, recurrence, reappearance of the material, what comes before. This is the first time that Beethoven do these kind of things. And this is the first sonata that play through without a break. Okay, you cannot find it in Beethoven's earlier sonata. You cannot find any of it in Mozart or Haydn or anybody else at that time. So this is a big breakthrough. And this kind of recurrent previous movements material can be found in his late work as well. You can find it in his Symphony No. 9 as well. Okay? So uh, people always regard as this sonata, Op. 27 No. 1, is a really big piece and very important by Beethoven, okay? Because he has so many things that never happened before. In my personal view of point, uh, point of view, okay, my personal thinking, Beethoven is actually not looking ahead. Actually, he is looking backwards because this kind of contrasting parts Slow, fast, slow, fast, okay? Uh, very calm, 
okay, a little bit lively, very lyrical, and very happy at the end. This kind of uh, contrasting section, a uh, change of mood, is actually in the design of Baroque fantasy. In Baroque fantasy, you play through the whole piece without a break. However, the fantasy itself has many parts, and each independently different from the next one. And between the parts, you will hear a drastic change of key and color. Okay? All this has been represented in Beethoven's uh, fantasy sonata, okay? the Apollonian one. The next Apollonian sonata is the worst time that we talk about the sun, sunrise. Okay? Uh, Beethoven, in his first design, it is a free movement, big sonata. Uh, if you talk about the mid period, the biggest sonata is the Walsh time and the upper sonata. Okay, you have other famous ones, but they are not as huge as these two. And you know, technically speaking, you know, those are the, the, the most difficult ones as well. Okay. However, he has a slow movement in the middle. And then it is so long and makes the piano sonata so long. And then people, you know, uh, started to advise him, don't, okay? Because if you have that long of a sonata, people will go home before you play the last one, okay? So he take the advice, uh, which is to our surprise, because he never listened to people, okay? Uh, he take away the adagio, okay? Uh, and make it as a separate piece. Right now, we name it adagio favorite, favorite adagio, okay, another piece. And instead, he put in a short introduction to the final movement. And this short introduction uh, has so many harmony change of colors. It really describes the sky during the sunrise. Okay? The color of the sky keeps changing. All right? So, uh, that's because of this introduction to the final movement, then they got the name of sunrise or the dawn, okay? Uh, because of this. And this sonata is very well thought out and very balanced. As you see, two big buildings and then one small introduction to the last one. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, Apollonian design of his middle sonatas, okay? Then we go to the next one. Uh, so in these two sonatas, always talking about intelligent, intellect, and logic over emotion, okay? So uh, you have to balance various elements when you uh, enjoy listening to those sonatas, and also when you perform especially, okay? Now, uh, then we talk about the other two sonatas. Uh, we, we talk about the uh, Dionysian sonatas. The first one is the Moonlight Sonata. Everybody, you know, quite familiar with it. And uh, the second one is the Upper Sonata, okay? The, uh, the, the Passion, okay, actually, the sonata. Uh, both of these names are not given by Beethoven, uh, obviously. He sells these pieces to the publisher. The publisher, you know, wants to sell more copies and give them, you know, fancy names so you can sell more, okay? Uh, but, you know, actually, those names really describe uh, the sonata very well, the characteristic of the sonata very well, okay? Uh, both of these works is actually a culmination uh, on human emotion, okay? Really, your feeling. Uh, it arises, uh, arises uh, your excitement. Uh, some of the passages are very exaggerated and excessive, okay? Those are the major characters of romantic characters, okay? Uh, obvious emotion, passion, sometimes the dark side of the human nature, uh, sometimes even madness at the end, okay? Uh, 
So when you talk about these two sonatas, and when you play them, when you enjoy them, at the end, it is not fulfillment, okay, but exhaustion. <laughs> okay, everything just drained. Okay, you have nothing left when you uh, listen or, or perform this kind of work. So it's, it's completely different feeling that a performer will, will, will gain at the end of playing or performing those sonatas. Okay, and those music as well. Uh, and we talk about the moonlight, obviously the first one is talking about the moon. We have a very interesting uh, small movement in between. And then the last movement is really a, a, a you know, outpouring of uh, emotion and passion. Okay? Uh, uh, I think this piece is particularly uh, closely linked to uh, uh, our great poem, uh, poet in Tang, uh, the Tang Dynasty, uh, Lei Ba, Li, Li Bai. Okay? Uh, so if you talk about, uh, uh, you know, when I first studied this one uh, years ago, uh, you know, when I still remember, I, I tried to memorize some, some Chinese poetry. So if you uh, read the uh, Li Bai, Fa Gan Bok Chok, right? Those particular phases of Chinese Tang Dynasty poetry really describe the last movement very well. Okay? Very passionate, very romantic. So this is the design of the uh, uh, moonlight, okay? Uh, this is the design of the upper sonata. Uh, the first movement is very passionate, red hot, uh, almost, you know, when you play through the first movement, when it reaches its end, then, you know, it's the end, okay, of human being, emotion. And when you play through the last movement to the end, it's like nothing left. Okay, everything is burned, everything is exhausted, everything is destroyed, nothing. Uh, luckily, in the middle, it is a very balanced, very well thought out uh, lyrical pieces. Because uh, as you can see, the first one is very emotional, the last one is very exhausting. Uh, both of them uh, you know, represent a lot of emotion and excitement. So what should be in the middle? You have to release some of the tension. You have to come down, okay? So it is a very nicely designed movement. Among those four sonatas, this middle movement, I think, is the greatest one. And it is the worst, I mean, it's the best thought out and planned lyrical movement. At the beginning, when you first listen to it, it is a carol as if you are passing through a church, you listen to those people singing, okay, and singing in players. And then that particular thing started to grow and build on the terms of variation. It becomes faster and faster and faster. However, the mood is always calm, nice, and lyrical. Never you know, because I get faster and faster, then I get more excited. Okay, no, it's not like this. And then you can see the rhythm, every time the next variation comes, it is always double the speed of the previous one. Okay, so you can see those kind of things are really coming from the structural ones, the logic ones, the Apollonian character of Beethoven. The first and the last movement, obviously, is Dionysus, okay? It's Dionysian characteristic, it's romantic, okay? So these are the design of those two sonatas. It really talks about human emotion, that's it, okay? Uh, so those are the two sides of Beethoven's, uh, those, for those four sonatas. Uh, 
Now, then we talk about performance. As a performer, how are you going to handle these kind of things? Okay. Uh, I have found a very interesting thing in the neck. Okay, when you play the piano, uh, this is how you need to control everything. And this is how your brain, okay, various parts of your brain control the various parts of your body when you play, when you perform the piano. Although obviously you have to control your eye, your ears, two hands, okay, then you have to count the time because we, you know, the Western music, you have the rhythm, you have the time signature, you have the bar line, everything. Uh, obviously, you have to control your ten fingers, okay? Mm, uh, uh, spatial, okay? Sometimes you don't need to look, and then you can still know where are those keys without looking, okay? Uh, the last things are, the, you know, the, 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 the last ones are very important, okay? Because music... Uh, really represents the last two characters, the, the lowest two elements, okay? Uh, artistic interpretation uh, uh, and all those conceptions and uh, your thoughts about the pieces are all bringing out, okay? So when you perform a piano, actually you are using so many different parts of your body and your brain to finish this task. Not to mention, we also need to control the pedal. It doesn't say we, how, how are you going to control your feet as well, okay? You need to use those as well. So when we play about a piece, then we obviously talk about four elements. The first thing, uh, sorry, uh, we, we need to go through this. This is very easy to understand. You have the man, the pianist, and then you have the instrument, okay? The pianist, control the instrument, and then you make music, all right? So, uh, as a pianist, then four major elements are involved in making music. The first one is obviously physical. Uh, a while ago, we talked about playing piano, you have 88 keys, and then you only have 10 fingers, and you have three pedals, and then you have two feet, okay? then you need to uh, train your technique, uh, the skills of handling this instrument, or you can, own, you can you, you, sometimes you can just regard the piano as a kind of tools, okay, uh, for you to reach uh, the end, okay. Uh, the second one is you have to uh, grow your perseverance. That means you, you know, uh, those are, uh, when you play through all those four sonatas, uh, it will last, the music itself will last uh, one, 1.5 hours, one hour and 30 minutes, just the music, okay? Not to talk about intermes uh, intermission uh, or, or the little break between the sonatas. So it's lots of work. You have to sustain this kind of high concentration and physical demand and strength as well. And then obviously, uh, you have to uh, control your exhaustion, okay? Uh, you cannot uh, let go everything at the beginning. Then you won't have any uh, gears or any oils left for the last mile. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, energy, it all comes from physical ones, okay? The second element as a pianist, obviously, we need to control is mental, obviously. Because uh, you play all the sonatas, uh, uh, it is more than, I think, more than 100 page or something like that, okay? Uh, uh, you, you remember all of them. Uh, uh, and then sometimes, you know, when you perform, you cannot uh, let it go as an auto machine, okay? Sometimes you have to anticipate. You have to prepare what is going to come up. It all controlled by mental, okay? And then you have to plan. Where should I give? Where should I run? Where should I hold back? Okay? Uh, how to play each piece as well, okay? And then the last one is what? I cannot even see, although it is made by me. Uh, yes, play with understanding. You have to understand what the composer really means behind the notes 
or why he writes music like this, okay? Or why he writes such harmonies, okay? So to play without understanding, then don't need pianists anymore. Computer can do better than us, okay? Okay, this is mental. And then we have the reasoning part. Uh, that means when you play the whole thing, you have to be logical, okay? You have to be in control. Everything must do appropriately. You have to reason, okay? And then the last one I cannot see, please help me. Uh, comprehension, okay? Uh, so this is very important. However, you also need emotion. If you have all the other three, previous three, those three, your playing would be very cold. You are not going to move people. You are not going to make your playing interesting, okay? Only by adding your emotion, then it becomes your performance. Because as we talk about music, we talk about the composers and the pieces or the music they composed. However, those notes written on the paper is not music. It is when us, the performer, touches the keyboard, makes sound, that very moment, music comes out. Okay? So, the composer is the creator. The performer is the re-creator. Re we are the re-creator. Without us, music is nothing. Okay? Uh, so when you talk about emotion, then it is subjective, involving, outburst, and sometimes, what you say? Okay, ex 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 explosion, okay? So that means you let go your emotion. However, if you let go your emotion every single time, you won't have m much gas left in your gas tank, okay? At the end of not to say force on others, even one, okay? So you need the other three to help you as well, okay? So when we can manage these four elements, then we talk about music. With those two, four elements all balanced out, all thought out, then the pianist can control the keyboard and make music, okay? Now, let's continue. Uh, so uh, this is the drawing of Beethoven. And this is the late Beethoven drawing, actually. Uh, so uh, at the end, during his late years, uh, he's completely introspective. Sometimes you cannot even tell if he has those two sides, okay? Because he's an old man. He accepts the fate at the end. But during the middle, middle period of time, he is still trying very hard to struggle. So the two sides of Beethoven is actually the Apollonian side and the Dionysian side of Beethoven. Okay. So on, on one hand, he is a uh, I mean he is a classical composer. On the other hand, he is really a romantic composer. And in the whole deve development of Western music, uh, we have several great composers, which really opened the gateway for the next period of time, okay? Uh, the first one uh, is Monteverdi, the second one is Beethoven. The next one is Wagner. And then in the 20th century is Schoenberg. If we talk about Bach, he is not a pioneer, he is not a groundbreaking composer. He writes everything in the old style. He writes every genre that the old style have left for him. However, he wrote those things so great and so perfect that nobody surpasses him. Now, there's a big problem. What is the big problem? If nobody can write better than him, in that old language, or that new, or uh, sorry, the old medium or media, you have to go to a new direction. 
So it is the same thing with Haydn and Mozart. Okay, Haydn and Mozart. Haydn built up the whole foundation for a classical. Mozart uses all those things that Haydn created and write those compositions and compose so nicely and so perfectly that nobody can surpass. So Beethoven comes, what is he going to do? Walk another direction. Okay? So uh, we, in this talk, I try to explain the two sides of Beethoven and also trying to show that he is the man who opens the gate to the Romanticism. Okay. That's the part I would like to talk about. Any questions? Any, any, any question? Any, anything you want me to uh, explain more? Uh, you can ask questions in Chinese, Cantonese, <laughs> Mandarin, doesn't matter. Any question? Yes or no? No? No question? Okay. Very good Chinese student. Never question. Okay. I teach so many years. <laughs> and never challenge your point of view. Okay. Uh, anybody say, you know, uh, what I have to talk about is nonsense? No? Nobody challenge? That's very bad. Okay. Uh, some of my students are here. Uh, uh, still remember the two mottos? I teach in the class, okay? What's your right as a student? Still remember? Yes, to make mistakes. As a student, I can always make mistakes because I come here to learn. Then please, what is your responsibility? Huh? If you have right, then obviously you have responsibility, right? What is your responsibility? Surpass your teacher. Beat him, okay, the one sitting here. <laughs> Be better than him, okay? Otherwise, uh, I don't teach you, okay? No question, right? Uh, so, uh, what next? I would like to uh, play some passages for everyone uh, and show some of my points, okay? So, let's go to the uh, uh, Apollonian sonatas first, okay? Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to talk and play at the same time, so maybe I will play some mistakes uh, because I don't uh, get used to this kind of doing, okay? Uh, the fantasy sonata, the first part is... Hear this part of the movement. Beethoven is not angry. He's very calm. Okay? Oh. And uh, obviously, you, uh, I have already gone through three sections. 
Every session is well planned. Okay, uh, never go too far. All right, this is the second part of the piece. The next one, uh, let me see. Last one. very happy then it ends okay so this is his Apollonian side now the same series of uh, sonata then we still we have this okay uh, the Moonlight Sonata everybody knows
Okay. Actually, Beethoven is a very poor composer of writing melody. The whole Moonlight Sonata, what have you here, are all colors of harmony. Very beautiful. But there's no line, there's no singing line. Okay? He's very poor in doing so. Who can write beautiful melodies at East without any problem? Mozart, Schubert. Okay? Not Beethoven. Uh, so when we go to the second movement of the Moonlight, okay, uh, 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 Anton Rubinstein, the great Russian pianist in the 19th century, norm normally say, you know, it is a small flower between the two uh, summit. Okay, very simple. Uh, I, I, I need to concentrate. Last one is very passionate. Another world, okay. Oh. So this is uh, very different. So uh, one is very emotional, the other one is very calm uh, or very reasonable, okay. Uh, I play a little bit uh, the uh, moon. Uh, I mean, we have the moonlight. Now we have the rise, sunrise. Okay, uh, that one is much easier to uh, emotionally speaking. It's much easier to handle. Every time when you play those so-called objective ones or more balanced ones, uh, it is very, um, normally it is easier for the player to handle, okay? Uh.
this is the first movement. So we can see it is very, uh, what, how do you say it, it is very uh, solid, uh, uh, like a Greek building, everything is uh, always positive, okay? Uh, always sunny and always in control. Uh, this is his uh, second movement. So-called introduction. Nothing, no melody. then become a little bit complicated. back to the beginning. Surprise. Surprise. in handy <laughs> okay so you can see the whole thing it is very 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 positive very 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 uh, up spirit okay 
uh, on, on the obscurious side. But this is certainly not. <coughs> Sorry. Immediately change to another world. Out, ask the same question. Don't know. Does that ring a bell? Remember this? Mi 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 do re 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 si comes from here. Loss of drama, loss of unexpected things, loss of emotion. about the best melody or the 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 the, the, the Deutschest bit of a kind right. Suddenly soft, suddenly loud. angry, okay, uh, uh, without any reason, okay. So many different emotions going on. Okay, uh, this is completely different than the war's time. Okay, now we go to the middle movement. Okay, the carol. This is the first one, and then variation.
open faster. sonatas okay so some of the passage you can really think he's thinking about the devil it's all darkness oh. well I guess what I'm going to talk about and make my point uh, tonight I have uh, hope I, I did make a good point 
And uh, any question? Any anything you want to ask? Thank you very much for your teaching. Uh, thank you very much for your teaching. Uh, I remember that uh, last time when we were here, I brought your father uh, and some emotion to your learning piano. And now I want to know how much you preserve and how much you can tell us uh, about your interpretation and Sequeira Costa. That was a very, very great interpreter of Beethoven. Uh, uh, well, uh, I studied with him for a very long time, uh, more than 12 years, almost 13. Okay, we work on some of the Beethoven sonatas, okay? And uh, uh, obviously, he he uh, gave me a lot of uh, you know insight for each of those masterworks. Uh, you know because uh, he also comes from a very very great tradition. Okay, uh, because he's one of his teacher is Vienna da Moda. Vienna da Moda is closely linked with the Beethoven tradition. Uh, he's the least, last student, and least is the student of Chen Yi, and Chen Yi is the student of Beethoven. So uh, I think my master really teach me how to get into the inside world of Beethoven. That is very important for me. Uh, we don't come to turn on some of the interpretations. And I have my own ideas, and sometimes he won't do uh, the same thing if he is going to play the same sonata. But what's lucky for me, he's always very open-minded, and he always say, okay, after I play something different, or uh, you know, not uh, as what he taught okay, me, uh, he would say, okay, son, okay, you, you, you do very well. Okay, uh, I don't agree with you. Uh, if I play the same page, I, passage, I won't do the same thing. However, since you do it so well and so convincing, uh, you continue to do it. It's your own. Uh, this is, I think, the, the, the most important thing I got and the greatest encouragement from my master. Uh, uh, those are the things I would like to say. Okay. Uh, in particular, I think I appreciate his interpretation of other words better than his playing of Beethoven. Okay, if he's playing Chopin, Ravel, and uh, Ramaninov, those I'm completely, you know, I think is out of this world. But for some of the Beethoven interpretation and his conceptions, I mean conceptions, uh, I don't always agree with. Okay. Uh, but that's life. <laughs> so I, I hope I, uh, yeah. Uh, one more thing is I think uh, the first great teacher who really brings me closer to Beethoven is uh, Zhao Guangyan, Zhou Guangyan, the professor in uh, Beijing. Okay, at that time I'm only a teenager. Uh, my parents brought me back to their school and ask their teachers to teach me. She's the teacher who is responsible for fixing me good, okay? And uh, since he grows up in Germany, and he studied with those German masters, so everything he taught me in playing the Beethoven is exactly very precise. Must be very precise. Read everything according to the book and be serious to the last note. And I also appreciate her teaching very much. Uh, by the way, she just passed away, I think, half a year ago in her 90s. So, uh, yeah, those are the things I would, I would like to share with you. <laughs> Thank you.
Any other questions? Uh, if no, then I think uh, we can call it a day. Okay? Okay, thanks again for coming over. And uh, I hope to see everybody in the concert as well. Okay? Thank you.